Yeah, I just I was just laughing backstage because on uh, on Friday night we have our community group and this goes well with the sermon. Um, we have parents with kids in our in our house on Friday nights for Bible study and fellowship and um, and. <laughs> One of our children uh, downstairs began to vomit all over our furniture, and uh, they were just having too much fun, and uh, so it was fine. It was okay, um, but we literally had to throw the entire couch away um, because it was, uh, it was pretty bad. It was, it was bad. I mean, I was willing to clean it, but it was that bad. Um, it just made me think how quickly now we have to update our furniture in our house uh, because of because of community and connection, and the poor kid, he felt so bad, but it, it was okay. Uh, just, I'm just thanking God that, you know, it wasn't all over other kids, and it was on our couch. So, well, welcome again to Calvary. It's so, it's good, so good to be up here again. <laughs> no, I'm being serious about that, yeah. Um, it really did happen, too. We literally just chucked this couch in the trash. Um, I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to continue our series, Church According to Jesus. And we're looking at what church was intended to be. Uh, Not that we have it all figured out here at Calvary, not that I have it all figured out, but we're looking at Jesus and trying to match our lifestyles, our walk, and even our church as a whole to follow Jesus and to be a church that, that does what Jesus called us to do. And we learned last week that Jesus is calling us to go make disciples, to be disciples, be disciples ourselves, students and followers of Jesus that go and reach people. And I'm happy to announce something that's really cool. You know, at Calvary, we're, we do so much outreach. We're getting ready to be in a huge outreach season uh, with the Operation Christmas Child, our Thanksgiving uh, day of, of feast and food and delivering food, um, our play as well, our Christmas play, we do, we do a party for uh, the women's shelter at, at Shepherd's Place. We do a lot of different things to reach out. And then that doesn't even include everything you're doing, you know, everything you're doing behind the scenes. Um, we, we have brought on someone on staff full time now to help us to really hone in on that. We've never had an outreach or reach director at Calvary. We've kind of all been doing our different things as pastors and leaders. And I, God had put on my heart one of the first moves you need to make is, is get a reach director that could just focus on our We Love Our City events and help us reach even more. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to announce that we have brought on Sam Cruz as our new reach director to help us do that. I wanted you to see this because we're not joking about reaching. We're not playing around, we are serious and he's going to be able to focus on that and help us as an entire church to be intentional even more about reaching our community. I'm really excited. He's a friend of mine as well. He loves Jesus. I mean, you see him up here singing every week. That's the same guy. He loves Jesus. This whole band loves Jesus. He loves Jesus too. And um, it's just going to be great to have him. He's already been uh, working this week, and we can't find him because he's out there evangelizing and reaching people. It's like, where's Sam? Oh, he's out. He's out talking to people about Jesus. So it's exciting. Um, and that's something we all do as a staff, and it's something we all do as the church. So I, I just really want to, I already know right now, this is probably going to have to be a two-part sermon. <laughs> and uh, I just really want to help you guys understand where I'm, where I'm going with this series one more time. Um, what God's put on my heart is for us to be a church that's a disciple-making movement, that's the body of Christ, that's without walls. That's what I see Jesus doing. And what I'm laying out in this series is really more than just um, vision. It's actually a strategy. It's actually a strategy that if you were to reach someone, what do you do with them? And in fact, it's a strategy and it's a focus on you as a follower of Christ. What should be your focus as a follower of Christ? So there's really a lot of layers to this message and you can apply it in so many ways. And I really want us to think about that and, uh, and just to see this progression that goes on in this series. Because here's the five values of a disciple-making church. The first one we covered last week, and we really only scratched the surface, and that is reach. And then we, this week, we're going to talk about connect. And then next week is grow. Well, maybe not now, because we need two parts on connect. And uh, empower, and then go. And I'm breaking those down, 
And I'm not, a really good, I'm not really good at English grammar, so all my English grammar teachers, I prefer the present participle <laughs> of reaching, am I right? Connecting, growing, empowering, and going. In other words, the active present, so to say, participle, if that exists, the active body of Christ. And someone told me at community group on Wednesday night in my house, uh, I have a group of leaders learning how to run groups in my house right now on Wednesday nights. And one of them said something that really just kind of, I really wanted to share this with you. Because it really, it hits, you guys are still getting to know me as your lead pastor. And I want to be completely transparent with you. Um, they said this, and it really, it really summarizes my heart. One of the guys said, you're really calling us to be an active church like actively living out the word of God. Not that we're not already, but he's just, he was just saying, you're really, what I heard on Sunday is that you're not just wanting us to come in on Sunday and hear a sermon and then go home and do nothing with it. You're actually challenging us to do something with the sermon. And I gotta tell you, church, um, this, I'm speaking from my heart here. I don't think we have time to wait 10 years to reach people. I don't, I don't think we have time to wait two, two years to, to start being ready. You know, I really feel like now is the time to start making an impact even more in our community, in our neighborhoods. We really don't have the time to wait. Amen. Praise God. And I realize that in this room, there are so many different walks of life. And so some of you may be like, well, Ryan, I'm still learning how to know Jesus and and connect with him. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, I, I know. And some of you have been around for uh, a while and you're like, I know all this stuff. But for me, I've been around a long time as well. And I, you know what I realized is I don't always apply what I hear. And so this is an entire series is just to help us get back on track. And then if you're new here and you don't know Jesus that well, or maybe you're learning what it means to follow Jesus, I don't want anyone to be overburdened or overwhelmed. I'm really just helping us follow Jesus. And so this is great for every level because we all sometimes just need a refresher. And uh, so this series isn't just a series. This series is a culture, a way of life at Calvary. We want to be a reaching, connecting, growing, empowering, and going. And what I mean is, what do you do with someone who has reached? What do you do with them next? Well, today we're going to talk about that. Because if you go out and you do the Thanksgiving feast, and you invite someone here, and they're overwhelmed by the love of Jesus, what do you do next? Or if you bring someone to the Christmas play, and, and they're like, wow, I felt the love of God there. I, felt, I saw the message of redemption through Scrooge, that there's, there's second chances for everyone, and I want to give my life to Jesus. What do we do next? Have you ever thought about that? Because sometimes in my life, I thought that people were fine if they just came to church and sat in the pew and they're just gonna, they're just gonna magically grow. And then God was smacking me around a few years ago and going, they don't just need church, they need a community. They need people to show them what you mean. How many of you rather see a model than just hear about it all day? That's what people need. And so that's my heart today in this message, and it's already 10 o'clock. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm down to earth. Just go with me here. What did Jesus do? Jesus called people to be with him. Matthew 4, 18 through 22, Jesus invited disciples to be with him. They weren't even disciples at the time. They didn't know that yet. They were fishermen. And he said, come follow me and I will make you fishermen. I think sometimes we look at that and we, we look right at the work or the journey and we're not seeing the essence of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, come be with me. Mark three fourteen actually says that he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So he was asking them to come to him. And it was in that moment where they come to be with Jesus 
that he would begin to transform them. You know what happens in Christianity is we tend to want people to be transformed before they even get encounter an encounter with Jesus. We want people to be transformed and to look like Jesus, but they haven't even hung out with Jesus yet. Like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to look like. How, how, can, I be, how can I be like Jesus when I don't even know what he looks like yet? And so this is what Jesus is saying is, come follow me and you'll become more like me. And I love, pretty much what I see Jesus is saying is that they belonged with him and then they became like him. Do you know how many people want to just feel like they belong to something? Our society is looking to belong to someone or something. That's why cultures exist. That's why communities exist. That's why restaurants are creating atmospheres. Have you ever been to um, a Sheets out in, uh, like in Pennsylvania? Anyone know what Sheets is? It's like a Wawa with just greasier food. <laughs> Being dead serious. <laughs> serious as a heart attack. Um, you know what they started doing? They started putting furniture and tables and chairs inside and outside their restaurant to create community. So that people could grab lunch and talk together and be in that restaurant instead of eating in a car, getting food all over their suits. Like a cheesesteak, just squeezing out right on their suit. <laughs> I, you're not here during the week, but when I'm out in the lobby, I'm hanging out with people all the time and it's awesome. Our food pantry, sometimes we have 60 people sitting out there and I'm watching our food pantry team feed them and love on them and give them coffee and water and it's just beautiful. The spaces that we have in this church to connect are so important, but it's also we as the people. That's the bigger thing. We as the people, including people into our lives. And I want to go into this next scripture, Matthew 9, 9 through 13. You can turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 9. I really want us to see the heart of Jesus again because he practically called us to come be with him so that we become like him. I think if there's something you can write down in your notes right now, write that down. Be with Jesus to become like Jesus. Be with Jesus to become like Jesus. Because I think a lot of us, as I'm speaking to us as disciple makers in the room, a lot of us don't think we can do what Jesus did, but you can. You can, because you're being transformed to be like him. And the same spirit that Jesus depended on in the Bible, if you read, if you read the story of Jesus, he was filled with the Holy Spirit after the temptation, or at, yeah, after the temptation in the desert. He came out of that desert full of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was upon him at baptism, at water baptism. And so he had the Holy Spirit to help him do the ministry. Isn't that weird that Jesus needed the Holy Spirit? By the way, Jesus stopped and prayed with God. He needed God. He needed his Father. He needed his internal community of the Holy Spirit, the Father, and himself. And so we also have the Holy Spirit to help us. So we are becoming more like Christ. But what I love to see Jesus do is Jesus connects with us, but then he wants us to connect with people in our community. And that's how we'll make disciples. Let's look at Matthew 9, and we're going to look at verse Nine. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his, ta at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Now, there's not a lot in there. <laughs> you know, we're not seeing the whole context. It could have been like Matthew was second guessing for like 30 minutes. And they didn't take the time to put that in the scripture. We don't, we don't know. But look what happens next. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees of the day are leading priests of the temple who know everything about the Torah or the law of the Bible. The first five books, they know the prophets. Uh, they know the Old Testament pretty much. Okay, they know this by heart. They are the people who do everything perfectly according to them. But according to Jesus, he calls them out in quite a bit as you read scripture. So the most holy, righteous people. This is what happens. 
But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Wow. Here they are, supposed to be pious and perfect, and they're calling people scum. That's an insult right there. That's a sin. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. What was he saying there? They were really good at offering sacrifices, but terrible at showing love to outcasts and everyone around them. So Jesus is like, you can do all this for me, you could do, or you can do this all for God, but the reality is on the other side of the coin, you're being a jerk. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Everyone's a sinner, but only those who recognize that they do sin or need Jesus will actually come to encounter Jesus the way they should. They will see other sinners and they won't elevate themselves. They'll go, man, I know what they're going through because I've been there. I'm a sinner too. That's who Jesus is is able to connect with because they acknowledge that they need Jesus. But the priests, they didn't want to acknowledge that. Now, this scripture comes to life even more when we understand the context of this story. Matthew is a tax collector. And tax collectors were scum to the priests and to many Jews that weren't priests. Because they gouged people of their finances. They worked for Rome. They collected taxes from their own people and gave it to Rome. But there's something interesting about Matthew. Matthew was a port tax collector. Matthew was working the ships, the boats that came in with all the products, all the things, all the merchandise. And Matthew had the opportunity to gouge even more money from his people. So it's known that Matthew is the scum of scum. Here's the thing about that. The Pharisees were very verbal about how they felt, and so were Jews, how they felt about tax collectors. And one of the things that rabbis would teach about tax collectors, and this is shocking, I read this in my study this week, and it's shocking. They would say that tax collectors could never be forgiven. Can you imagine being a person walking around with that in their heart? Just take a moment and think about that. That I could never be loved or accepted or forgiven because of what I'm doing. Can anyone relate? or used to relate before you met Jesus? To walk around with that belief of myself that I'll never be forgiven would destroy a person's soul. And yet, Jesus goes up to Matthew, which is unheard of for a priest to do. A great rabbi or teacher would never even come in contact with a Matthew because they didn't want to associate with them or look like they're bad. Their reputation was on the line if they were around a sinner like him. And Jesus goes and says, come hang out with me. Come follow me. And then to make matters worse, Matthew says, come have a party at my house. And who shows up? I mean, to go into the home of a, of a Jew who is a tax collector, a scum of the scum port tax collector, and have food is to say, I accept you, and we are in fellowship together. And fellowship back then was huge. Hospitality was huge. It meant loving one another. Jesus is hanging out. He's pretty much destroying his reputation so to say, for Matthew. He doesn't really care about his reputation, does he? He's not really worried about that. He doesn't care what they think. He just cares about Matthew's soul. And he goes to his house to have food. 
to connect. And he called Matthew to connect with him. This was messing up the priest's theology and view of God and Jesus. It was messing up, especially their view of Jesus. They did not like it. But listen, looking at this scripture, what we see is, is that Jesus didn't just reach the lost. He connected with them in fellowship. And I think sometimes as a, as a pastor's kid and as a Christian and growing up in this church, I think I overlooked some of that. I think I overlooked some of that as I was reading that they were about to spend three and a half to four years together. That Jesus is about to make Matthew, he calls Matthew his friend in the book of John. And yeah, Matthew changes, but Jesus loves him before he even changes. Listen, if you're in this room today and you think you can never be forgiven, it's not true. This scripture proves us wrong. You can be forgiven for anything. And Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to just come to church and then, and then you leave. Jesus longs to have a relationship with you when you leave this building. And he's welcoming you into a community of fellowship. This is the, this is the wildest part of it all. Now these Jewish fishermen who can't stand tax collectors have to hang out with Matthew for three and a half years. <laughs> Do you think they probably had a problem with that? Absolutely. Jesus is saying, come into my fold, come hang out with me, and it's not even like he's thinking about the other guys. Wait, what about, we gotta eat with this guy, we gotta sleep in the same building with this guy, what's going on here? It's radical. You know why? It's church according to Jesus, not us. It's church according to Jesus, not us. Jesus simply wants us to connect relationally. And I want to tell you this right now today before I, you know, because it looks like I have to chop this up. Although I do have an idea to maybe put this on a video on, online. Maybe that will help. I'll do the rest of the sermon online. Can I do that? So I can stay on track? Can I, can I, can that be okay? I'm, I'm, de I'm asking you, I'm seriously asking you, can I do the rest on a video on YouTube? No? No, you don't want me to? No, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll be this genuine, I'll I promise. Um, listen, I, we need to understand that connecting relationally is spiritual. And I never thought about that until this week. Like I have two points to break down now connect spiritually or relationally and spiritually and God hit me in the face this week and said it is spiritual to connect with people relationally you know why it's love and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself so when we connect with someone relationally we're breaking down walls we're showing people that they're forgiven or that they're accepted. And they may not know that they're forgiven. They may not have even asked for forgiveness. They may not feel loved or welcomed yet. But once they get to hear the message of Jesus and they see that we're there in their life, they're loved. And that's exactly what they needed because they never thought that they could be loved or accepted. They never thought that they could change. And now someone like you who comes in their life who has been changed, you have a story and you get to show your love and acceptance and, and say, I was like you or I was like this and now I'm not and I'm different and I found Jesus loves me. I'll show you some screens here. Connection is a relationship bond that permeates through the entire discipleship journey. Relationship is within disciple making. And the church body doesn't have to be cool. You don't have to be cool. You don't have to be relevant. You know what you, know what you have to be? You know what we have to be? We have to be real. We need to be real. People don't need cool, relevant people. They need people to be authentic and real. Amen. We value that. I value that. I'd rather you be real with me and really love me. And disciple makers are loved people, loving people. You are a loved people. 
We have to come to the grips that God loves us, and so we're able to go love others like us because we're no different. We're not priests who look at sinners and go, I'm never getting around them. No, we were once them, and we're still fragile, vulnerable people who can sin, and we still need Jesus, and we need to relate to people and say, I know what you're going through. I've been there, and love them. You know what I also learned is that, and this is what I've learned from practice, from seeing it in my own home and other, and other groups, that community and connection cures loneliness. Such a simple concept, but loneliness is dangerous. Isolation is dangerous. And people are lonely and they're afraid and they're hurting and they have no one to turn to. And so when we bring them into a community or a group or friendship or even a dinner together, you're helping cure loneliness, which if too much loneliness leads to suicide or leads to severe depression and other bad things. I mean, the statistics are alarming what loneliness does to people, their health, their physical health and everything. And so as a church, we have to be super connecting I was reading, I'm reading a book called You Found Me by Rick Richardson, and here's the research he found. This is really interesting when it comes to the unchurched. I think we have it all messed up a little bit. 42% of the unchurched think church is good for society. 42% of them. Only 6% says the church is harmful. It's talking about us, but also the organization. Only 6%. What we hear in the news or in articles is, the church is terrible. 99% of the people don't want to go to church. They don't like the church. They don't like people that are Christians. That's actually not true. This study was done in the past year and a half, and they found the opposite. 78% of unchurched friends don't mind if their Christian friends talk about their faith if it's important to them. 78% are cool Unchurched friends are cool with you talking about your faith, especially if it's important to you. If it's important to you, that's cool. It is important to us, right? Yes. Listen, the, the idea, the, the misconception that our friends are not wanting to connect to God or the church is actually false. 55% of unchurched say an invite to church would be effective. 55 people. I've actually found that to be true as well. And by the way, church can also be a coffee with me because I'm the church. In fact, that's what I've been encouraging us to do is to start being the church outside these walls way before we ever come into these walls. Amen. I'm actually doing pretty good. We might be okay, everyone. Here's how we can practice connection. Show up in someone's life, especially when they are in need. When I see someone in need, I jump in. My neighbor was in need this week. I jumped in. I seized the opportunity to help him. Be a blessing by showing an act of kindness at work, the people you're working with, your neighbors, your friends. Be a blessing. And then invite people to belong. I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say here is this. Don't just invite people to a program. Invite them to a community of relationship and love. Invite them again to your home. Invite them again to hang out after the play. After, what did what, what you think about the play this year? You know, what spoke to you? Invite them to belong. We're not inviting people to a church organization. We're inviting people to a living church, which is us. And it's actually what people need. They need to be able to see love and how you follow Jesus lived out. And your connection is a bridge. Your fellowship and your connection is a bridge that leads to Jesus. And so the, the last part was connect spiritually. To connect and bring people into our church community is spiritual. And I already covered this. When Jesus came to people, his love broke through some of the darkest things in our life. Think about Matthew. An outcast, no one loves him, and Jesus simply saying, come be with me, and then him showing up was spiritual. It meant I love you. It meant I love you. 
You don't even love yourself. I love you. Wow. That must have spoke volumes. Another way we can connect spiritually is we can give a Bible. Isn't that funny? How simple that is. God gave me a dream this week. I'm going to go ahead and say it. God gave me a dream. I don't know how this is going to work yet. I'm putting it out there. I haven't thought it through. I didn't come, I'm not coming to you with some vision plan right now. But God gave me a dream because it was actually something that God put on Pastor's heart, Pastor Coon's heart years ago. A Bible in every home. Can you imagine the living Bible being in someone's house? A gift? You know what God showed me this week? That we would be in that lobby out there praying over Bibles, writing love notes in them, and packing them to every home in our, in our state. Wow. Wow. When I told Dorothy that, her logistic brain started going off, and, you know, it's her, whoa, okay. <laughs> well, if we have a bigger food pantry, we can use that space as well, right? How cool would that be? How cool would that be to pray over a Bible and send it to someone's home and they open it up for the first time and they see a prayer from one of us here at Calvary and say, we just, we just want to know you, we love you and Jesus loves you. And these words have changed my life in joy. Wow. Wow. It, it hit me when I'm praying on this past week. I'm like, wow, it's so simple. Let Jesus do the work too. Let him prime them way before we even get to meet them in Delaware. Let's send Bibles to every home. And let's just start giving out Bibles. We can, we can start accomplishing that by giving out Bibles at our workplace. So we're going to need money, by the way, to pay for all those New Testaments. It's going to be a lot. <laughs> but what a great way to spend. It's awesome. Pray for specific needs to be answered by faith. So when you come in contact with someone who has needs, pray for them and believe they'll be answered by faith, by the power of Jesus Christ. And then share what Jesus has done and continues to teach you. That's what I do all the time. If I'm out in the community and someone ends up talking to me and I hear about what's going on in their life, I just start sharing what God's been doing in my life and how it's possible for them. And lastly, I don't mean for this to come off harsh. I actually meant this to just be a process to think about. This is our last statement. We can't make disciples without a loving, relational community. If we truly desire to reach a loss, that's what I mean by, I didn't mean this to come out harsh with the if, the conditional clause there. But if we truly desire to reach a loss, we'll provide and be the community where they can be loved and known. In other words, we're not like, hey, you got saved, great, have a good one. <laughs> Enjoy your life. No. We will help them understand Jesus, follow Jesus, know that they're loved, know that they're known, know that they're heard by being a community. We'll be opening up our homes around Delaware. We'll be opening up our schedules to have coffees and dinners. We'll be inviting people after church to go out to eat, whatever it may be. We will make sure we form a community to help people get connected and loved. Because that's what disciples do and that's what Jesus did. Amen? Cool. Let's pray. I did it. I made it. We made it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for your patience. Seriously. God, thank you, Lord, for pouring out today. Thank you, Lord, for an amazing church that is patient and listens and receives this word. God, help us to not only reach, but to connect those we are reaching to you and to your church, which is us. Go with us, Lord, and help us do that this week. And be with everyone here who may feel lonely, who may not feel loved or known. God, I pray that in this church, we would be more aware of those around us in this room right now. And that we would show the love and kindness way beyond even the 60 seconds. I'm grateful for our 60 second greeting. But God, may we go above and beyond. Be with our new guests, Lord, as we get to meet and greet them in the back. Lord, and, and be with all of our partners and, and attenders here. Lord, thank you for such an amazing church. And thank you for connecting us to you and to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, church. Thank you so much.